Turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6, as we continue to make our way from eternity to eternity, going through the sacred pages of Scripture, looking at sacred history, we come now to the conquest of the land. And it begins here in Joshua chapter 6. Hear now the word of the true and living God. <clears throat> now, Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out, none came in. And Yahweh said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus you shall do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with, a, with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every one straight before him. So Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns, before the ark of Yahweh. And he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass on before the ark of Yahweh. And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before Yahweh went forward, blowing the trumpets, with the ark of the covenant of Yahweh following them. The armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the ark while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded the people, You shall not shout or make your voice heard, neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. So he caused the ark of Yahweh to circle the city, going about it once. And they came into the camp and spent the night in camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of Yahweh. And the seven priests, bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of Yahweh, walked on. And they blew the trumpets continually, and the armed men were walking before them, and the rear guard was walking after the ark of Yahweh when the trumpets blew continually. And the second day, they marched around the city once and returned into the camp, so they did for six days. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for Yahweh has given you the city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to Yahweh for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you, keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all the silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to Yahweh. They shall go into the treasury of Yahweh. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city." <clears throat> Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys with the edge of the sword. <laughs> but of the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belonged to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and <clears throat> brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel, and they burned the city with fire and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of Yahweh. <clears throat> but Rahab, the prostitute, and her father's household, and all who belonged to her, Joshua, saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Joshua laid an oath on them at that time, saying, Cursed before Yahweh be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. So Yahweh was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. Let us pray. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> Lord God, we desire to better understand you. And as we pause this evening and look at the conquest of the land, we pray that we would better understand who you are and that we would give you the awe and the respect that you deserve. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm in the unenviable position this evening to go through the entire book of Joshua. For 40 years, the people of Israel wander in the wilderness. An entire generation dies off in the desert. Yahweh not only takes Israel out of Egypt, but He's also working to take Egypt out of Israel. And after 40 years, it's finally time to go into the promised land. Yahweh, through Moses, instructs His people that they are to drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy their, all their stone uh, all their figured stones and destroy all their metal images and, and demolish all their high places. This is from Numbers 33, verses 51 to 53. So we see that this is not just a military campaign, but there's a spiritual component to this, which we'll expand upon in a few moments. The goal is to settle the land. It is to establish these wandering nomadic tribes into a cohesive nation in the promised land that had been promised to their forefathers. But in the midst of this, we also see that God is at work judging. God is judging nations. And that is a principle across time and space, that God judges nations throughout history. And we see that here with the conquest of the promised land. Now, it does begin on a sorrowful note. It ends with one of the, or it begins with the end of one of the greatest ministries the world has ever known. Moses is instructed in Deuteronomy 32 to ascend Mount Nebo. And it is there that he will see the land of Canaan spread before him, and he will die without ever setting foot in the promised land. And so he does. Deuteronomy 34 describes him doing just that. Now, the scene is of an old man. His face, no doubt, bronzed by the harsh desert sun and the harsh desert conditions. And yet, his strength, his vitality is still intact. His eyes are clear. His back is straight. His head is held high. We're told this in Deuteronomy 34 and verse 7. Moses is taken into glory. And yet, we wonder... How many conquests did Moses forfeit because of his disobedience? God's judgment upon Moses is death and that he will only see the promised land from afar. He won't actually be able to go into it. That, of course, is because of his disobedience for striking the rock when he was merely to speak to it. Numbers 20 recounts that. And yet, God is glorified in this because, after all, He is saving His servant. He is bringing him to glory, even though it is through judgment, even the judgment of death. Well, that brings us to Joshua. Uh, opening chapters are a passing of the baton. Moses is dead, but Joshua is the one who's going to take the people into the land. They actually cross the uh, Jordan River on dry ground, clear echo to the Exodus event. And it, the, the conquest itself actually begins in chapter 6 with Jericho. And in fact, before this even happens, back in chapter 2, when the spies go in and spy out the land, one of the very interesting things is that the conquest begins with a number one hit from 40 years ago uh, being the soundtrack for the conquest. Uh, you can channel your inner Casey Kasem here, right, with uh, the top 40 countdown. And there was a number one hit that was sang after the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea. It was, it was sang by Miriam and those who were with her in Exodus 15. Uh, and verses 15 and 16 go like this. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. Now, in Joshua 2 and verse 9, 
this lyric is on Rahab's mind. She remembers it, even though it's been 40 years. And she says, the fear of you has fallen on us, and all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. So it's in verse, but it's the same lyric. That number one hit is still on the top 40 charts. And that's what is on the playlist of this non-Israelite as the spies come into the land. Now, Israel is called, in Deuteronomy 7, verse 2, 20, and verse 17, they are called to devote to destruction all the peoples of the land. And we'll talk about that more in a moment, but let's just march through these chapters. Chapter 6 of Joshua, the conquest begins with a very unusual battle strategy, yes? Very unusual battle tactics. March around the city in silence. Priests, blow your trumpets. And then on the seventh day, make seven circuits around the city in silence. And then after the seventh circuit, everybody shout. And that's what they do. And the walls collapse, fall down flat. And Israel is victorious. Again, it's an impressive scene. But then the conquest stymies in Joshua chapter 7 with the booming metropolis of Ai. Now, that's facetious, of course. Ai was nothing more than a wide spot in the road. Maybe had one stoplight in it, if we're lucky. It's probably more of a stop sign, but anyway. And yet this tiny little town fights off the Israelites. And it's because there's sin in the camp. And after the sin has been rooted out, and the campaign continues with the defeat of Ai in Joshua chapter 8. Joshua chapter 9 is the Gibeonite deception. The people of Gibeon act in a very shrewd, a very cunning, that's the key word there, cunning manner. Uh, and in fact, that word there for cunning uh, in uh, verse 4 of Joshua chapter 9 is, it's not the same word, but it's a similar word to the word that is used to describe the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, how the serpent was crafty. Similar word, again, not the exact same, but it's interesting that the, chapter 9 begins with the, all the kings who were beyond the Jordan and the hill country and the lowland, all along the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, heard of this. They gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. So while you have all these people groups coming together to wage war, the Gibeonites present a contrast. And instead, they're more subversive. They deceive Israel to enter into covenant with them. And you do have these echoes where you have the cunning, uh, deceiving Israel. The cunning Gibeonites deceive. <coughs> it is similar to how Eve was deceived by the crafty serpent. And so Israel is deceived. The seed of the serpent continues to trip up the seed of the woman, as it were. <coughs> Excuse me. Chapter 9 concludes with the Gibeonites becoming woodcutters and water carriers for the congregation and for the altar of Yahweh, verse 27 tells us. Now, imagine that. You were on the chopping block one day. One day you were dead meat. The next, you're carrying water for Yahweh. Uh, what, a, what a stunning reversal. And also there are clear ties here between Joshua chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, how the Gibeonites dress themselves. And you compare that with Deuteronomy 29, verses 5 and 6, and what is presented is Gibeon is presenting themselves to Israel as Israel would have been except for Yahweh. And perhaps that tugged on the heartstrings a bit too. Chapter 10, you have five Amorite cities that are uniting against Gibeon. Ah, Gibeon who's just entered into covenant with Israel. You have Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, Eglon. And they all come together to come against Gibeon. And Gibeon's like, hey, uh, Israel, little help here. Remember that little covenant we entered into? And, and so it is that uh, the people of Israel come to the aid of the Gibeonites, but it's more than that. You see, way back in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16, God said to Abram at the time, he says, the sin of the Amorites is not yet complete. 
Well, when you come here to Joshua chapter 10, the sin of the Amorites is full and overflowing, and now Yahweh uses his people to administer justice and judgment upon the Amorites. And chapter 10 concludes with the conquest of the southern territory of Canaan. Well, chapter 11 is the account of the conquest of the northern territory in Canaan, as Hazor is represented here, the most powerful city in Canaan at the time. And this is the final phase of the conquest as the northern campaign is successful. And so it is that the people of Israel uh, come to conquer the land. Uh, You do have statements about how there were still some pockets of resistance, but they were promised it would be, Yahweh says, I will drive them out little by little, it says in Deuteronomy. And so it was intended that they were supposed to keep this up, and it was a gradual process of driving the peoples out. But here's what I'm after. Our skeptical friends may come to us and they may ask us, how can you believe in a God like this? Uh, God is a moral monster. He is commanding genocide. I just, I can't believe in a God who commands the massacre and mayhem of ethnic cleansing. Because that's what's going on here in Joshua's day. And this objection is based upon that phrase that we came across earlier, devoted to Yahweh for destruction. And that phrase means that the city would be annihilated. And that would include the people and the animals. And we read that in Joshua chapter 6. That's what happened in Jericho. And then whatever valuables there were, and we had a list there of gold and silver and bronze and iron, that would be set apart wholly unto Yahweh. And that's a clear echo of the plate that the high priest carried on the turban. And it was supposed to, it went into the treasury of Yahweh. Okay? And, and so, it, the people of Israel, they fulfilled the commission that was given to them, the command that was given to them. And this is especially seen in Deuteronomy 20, verses 16 through 18, where you have that commission to go in, and, and so they do. So how do we respond to that objection? Genocide, ethnic cleansing. Well, first, uh, let's start at the top, shall we? This really needs to start from above. And this objection engages in the cataclysmic error of assuming that the creature has the right to judge the actions of the creator. It assumes that the pot has the right to say to the potter, what have you done? And that is to make a serious error in categories. It assumes that we, finite, flawed, fallen creatures, have not only the intellectual acumen to pass judgment on God, but also the moral right to look upon the actions of Yahweh and say, you did wrong here. We do not have the right to pass judgment upon an infinite Holy God, whose wisdom exceeds all bounds. It is immeasurable. And and we think with our finite capacities that we have the resources and the moral capital to say, you did wrong. Nice try. No, that simply will not do. We do not have that right. And we are not capable of such judgment upon holy God. We've turned the whole thing upside down. But then, in the second place, this objection fails to take seriously the holiness of God in relation to sinful humans. You see, what's buried in the objection is the assumption that the inhabitants of the land of Canaan were just innocent people. Yeah, just minding their own business, going about their good and moral lives. And then those mean old Israelites, uh, prodded by their vengeful, wrathful God, came in and messed everything up. Um. That is a gross misrepresentation of the historical data. The Canaanites were not innocent people just minding their own business. They were rebel sinners engaging in the grossest forms of idolatry. Adultery, incest, bestiality, homosexual acts, child sacrifice. Not only were those permissible, 
These gross sinful actions accompanied their worship of false gods. And those false gods, by the way, were demons. That's what's in back of an idol. We'll see that when we look at Psalm 106 in just a moment. But no, these were not just innocent people minding their own business, living, living good moral lives. They were rebel sinners. And let's talk about their bloodlust and vengeance. It was just their, their appetite for that was just as insatiable as their gods was. And so these pagans and their worldview, that it led to profound moral corruption among the Canaanites. So that's the historical data. That's the starting point for any discussion about uh, the Canaanites themselves. But then in the third place, again, keeping everything in the proper order, God has the right to determine when a nation has reached the tipping point. God has the right to say, this is the point of no return, and there will be no more remedy here. God has that right as the infinite, holy God. And, that, and again, that's the fundamental difference between what Israel does in the conquest and what, say, any other nation has done historically. For example, let's take uh, the Nazis in, in Germany and what they did in comparison with Israel. Israel was the means through which God executed divine judgment. The Nazis, on the other hand, they demonstrate in themselves what happens when God merely lifts his pinky, removing his restraining influence and grace, and we see the true depraved nature of the human heart. That's what's going on, and that's the fundamental difference between these two. And, uh, these two. and in fact, what happened with the uh, the, the Nazis in Germany may actually be, there may be an argument there for the judgment of God in that regard. When, when evil, when God says, you want a little bit of chaos, here you go. Here's all you can stomach if you can. And that itself is a form of judgment. God determines when the cup of his wrath is full and overflowing. And that's what he is doing here with these various Canaanite people groups. And judgment has come. It's not unlike, you know, um, I, I don't know if you see them very much anymore uh, just because, well, it's just so unsafe. But back in the day when you had uh, the, the stunts that the daredevils would perform, and it was usually accompanied by uh, maybe even the, the daredevil himself would say to the camera, kids, don't try this at home, right? Well, in a similar way, that's kind of what it's like here with these, uh, shall we call it Yahweh's holy war. Um, don't try this without divine revelation. And Israel did. They had divine revelation. It was Yahweh saying, time's up. And now it is time for judgment. Also, uh, with the objection, it's genocide. It's ethnic cleansing. Um, calling what Israel did as genocide or ethnic cleansing, that assumes that Israel acted based upon xenophobia, and racial hatred and, and racism and things like that. But again, that's a gross mischaracterization of the biblical record. Go back and look again, and we covered it, Genesis chapter 12. The very first promise to Abraham was, in, uh, in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Remember when Israel left Egypt? It says that there was a mixed multitude of Israelites and non-Israelites who left Egypt. That doesn't seem very xenophobic or uh, I don't see any racism there. Hmm. How about here in the story itself? You have a non-Israelite and her family, Rahab. And she finds her place among Israel. The text says she's lived here ever since. Now this is all demonstrative. That Israel, they're not motivated by xenophobia, racism, ethnocentrism, any of that stuff. That is, those are actually modern lenses that we're reading back into the text. That simply will not do. The text stands for itself. What was motivated, what motivated the campaign in Canaan was not Israel's offense at the skin of the Canaanites. It was God's offense at the sin of the Canaanites. There's your preacher way of saying it, okay? Okay. Um, and, and then, many more reasons could be given, but just one more. The physical conquest symbolized a greater spiritual reality. And, and I touched on this just earlier, where in Numbers 33, they were told, not only 
Do you take care of the people, but also all their gods, all the high places, all that, all that idolatrous stuff? You need to cleanse that out of the land as well. And the physical campaign is emblematic of the spiritual reality of cosmic spiritual warfare. The judgment is not merely upon the people groups who occupied the land. It was also upon their gods, all their false gods. Israel is to not only uh, wipe all the people out, but also all their gods. And Yahweh, he had explicitly warned them back in Deuteronomy chapter 12, that when they went into the land, they were not to learn the ways of these nations. Deuteronomy 12 Listen to verses 29 and following. When Yahweh your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you be not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their God, saying, hmm, how did these nations serve their gods that I also may do the same? You shall not worship Yahweh your God in that way. For every abominable thing that Yahweh hates, they have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. There it is. That's, that's the consequences of that particular worldview. Is it leads inevitably to the destruction of life. And so God is saying, yes, destroy the people, but especially destroy their idols. Did they do it? Were they successful? Well, the psalmist actually gives further commentary on this in Psalm 106, verses 34 through 39. The text says, They did not destroy the peoples as Yahweh commanded them, but they mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. Listen carefully, verse 37. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. This shows us, again, it was spiritual warfare. That's what was really going on here. Their idols, of the idols of the people of the land of Canaan, those were demons to whom they were sacrificing. And so the conquest, again, it's not just Israel's holy war. They took up jihad or anything like that. It was Yahweh's holy war not only in judgment upon the people groups there, but also and especially upon the false gods and the demons and the spiritual forces of darkness. That is what is often overlooked in such objections. And again, it's not just our skeptical friends, but even some Christians, mm, it just it, it doesn't taste right. But usually that's because we're looking at things through the improper lens rather than through the divine lens of Scripture. So you get through chapter 12, Chapters 13 through 21 are very detailed instructions about dividing up the land, allotting the land. Uh, and I'll just say this in passing, that uh, in Joshua 18 and verse 1, then the whole congregation of the people of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The land they subdued before them. That is the same word that's used over in Genesis 1 and 21, the original commission to go into the world and subdue the earth. And so as Adam and Eve were commissioned to subdue the earth, so the Israelites subdue the land. There are clear parallels between the original paradise of God and now the promised land in Canaan. And those connections are intentional. The book of Joshua, near the end, chapter 21, verses 43 to 45, we read this, that thus Yahweh gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they settled there. And Yahweh gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for Yahweh had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one of all the good promises that Yahweh had made to the house of Israel had failed, all came to pass. Notice, Yahweh gave them all the land. There are those who will say, well, no, he, he, we're still waiting on the fulfillment of this promise. No, Joshua says different. It's also stated in the Kings somewhere. Someone has written, I can't wear the exact verses off the top of my head, but Yahweh gave them all the land. 
And he fulfilled the promise to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And uh, how is it? How is it that Israel came to possess and settle the land? Well, we see there in verse 44, Yahweh had given all their enemies into their hands. And also in uh, chapter 23, verses 9 and 10, Yahweh has driven out before you great and strong nations. It is Yahweh your God who fights for you. God did it. And it wasn't because Israel was the most numerous. In fact, they were the fewest. It was not because they were so strong. In fact, they were weak. It was all because of God that they were able to do this. So what was to be the response of the people of Israel to the kind providence of Yahweh? Well, chapter 23, this time verse 11, be very careful, therefore, to love Yahweh your God. Love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, just as the law says. That is the reverence that is due God for His undeserved gracious providence in giving you all the land and fulfilling His promise. In the larger scope of the, the theme that we've been exploring about God's glory and salvation through judgment, perhaps you've already made some connections here, that's great. Um, we've seen how skeptics, they often make a lot about the, the so-called genocide of the Israelites visited upon the inhabitants of the land. What is often overlooked is the mercy of God upon these sinful, rebellious people for generations. Again, over 400 years before Joshua and the people of Israel do their thing, over 400 years before that, God tells Abram, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The cup of my wrath, not yet full. It's filling up, but it's not full yet. Again, they, these were not innocent people just living their good moral lives. And Yahweh is not just any God, lowercase g, who's unworthy of honor. These were rebel sinners and they have rejected the only true and living God that there is, the only God worthy of worship. And they should have honored God as God. They should have given thanks. But instead, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness, and all that remains is justice and judgment. And so judgment was coming. It did come upon the rebellious people of Canaan. That was centuries in the making. Uh, again, a lot of people overlook that. But centuries of God's mercy. God delaying judgment, delaying judgment until finally the cup of his wrath was filled and overflowing and there was no remedy. And then in Joshua's day, right on schedule, God's people are the means through which Yahweh visits his judgment upon his enemies in the land of Canaan, both human and non-human, those spiritual beings, of course. But it is through this judgment upon all of these people groups, and we listed them all, they're in the text, right? Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, all the ites, right? It's through God's judgment upon all these various people that God is actually delivering his people into the land that he promised. God is glorifying himself by showing himself faithful to the promises that he made to the forefathers. And also, the salvation of the people of Israel that comes through the judgment upon Canaan and upon the gods uh, that the Canaanites worship. And that is all, all that judgment is for Yahweh's glory. And so Yahweh, he glorifies himself not only by saving his people, but saving his people through the judgment that he brings upon his enemies, which are Israelites, uh, the Israelites' enemies as well. What do we do with this? What does it mean for us? A couple of things that I want to bring to our attention. And I mentioned it just a moment ago. How God chose what is weak and foolish to shame the strong and the wise. This is God's typical modus operandi. And this is from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. Paul writes there, For consider your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Think about it. No one's writing the art of war, based on the Israelites' conquest of the land. God's military strategy for Israel looks foolish and weak to the world. 
There's no wisdom in it from the world's perspective. Israel, they were not the most numerous. In fact, they were the fewest. And yet God chose them to accomplish His purposes. He says as much in Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 and 8. There can be no boasting on Israel's part. No puffing out the chest saying, we did this. Oh, yeah, we're so powerful. Nope, nope, God did this. And Joshua understood that, and that's why he says what he says in chapter 23. And in the same way, that's the way it is with the church. God uses the weak and the foolish. He uses us to humiliate the world's idea of strength and wisdom. And in this way, no human being can boast in the presence of God. I mean, even the next verse, verse 30, and because of Him, that is because of God, you are in Christ Jesus. You, You realize it's only because of God that you're in Christ. That's what Paul says. It's all because of God. And He is to be praised for that. He is the one who we glorify and magnify as powerful enough. And so we ought to glorify God for fulfilling His purposes, faithfully fulfilling His uh, promises. And in Romans chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, I know contextually Paul is talking about Abraham here, but listen closely, and I believe we'll see how this applies to us. The text says, No unbelief made him, Abraham, waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith, as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Notice, it was a principle that was true in Abraham's day. I'm persuaded it was a principle true in Israel's day. I'm persuaded it's true for us even today. We must not waver in unbelief when it comes to the promises of God. Like Abraham, like Israel, uh, during the conquest, we need to give God glory because he is able, even more than able, to do what He has promised. And so, let us praise God for who He is, for what He's doing in our lives. Take a closer look here in verse 20, where the text says that He, Abraham, grew strong in His faith. Uh, That's okay. Uh, The way this is written, this is, uh, He grew strong is actually a passive voice verb. The New English translation, I think, hits the nail on the head when it says Abraham was strengthened. That strengthening didn't come from Abraham himself. He didn't just white-knuckle this thing and I'm going to do it myself. He was strengthened by God. God strengthened his faith. God strengthened Abraham's faith. And it was because of God strengthening Abraham's faith that he was able to give glory to God. Also, uh, the, uh, verse 21, fully convinced. That's another passive voice thing. This is Abraham being persuaded, fully persuaded, by God. He doesn't just sit there and persuade himself. God did this again. God strengthened Abraham's faith, and that caused Abraham to be completely certain of God's promises, the, tr- the truth of God's promises. And in the same way, and maybe to a degree, a greater way, through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, our faith in God will be strengthened as well. Our faith goes from strength to strength. God strengthens our faith by continuing to fulfill His promises toward us in Christ Jesus. God is faithful. He grants us more faith. We need to let God be God and glorify Him for being God. There's one more thing here. Notice, The verse begins by talking about how no unbelief made uh, Abraham waver. Instead, he grew strong in his faith. You see the two camps, and there's only two. There is unbelief, and there is faith. Again, there's no middle way, no third way, where it's, you know, pseudo, quasi, unbelief or faith or whatever. Unbelief or faith. Those are the only two possibilities when it comes to the promises of God. Will God keep His promises? Well, the sanctified heart says yes. We know He will keep His promises. Hmm. One more thing. It's a principle that we've uh, touched upon in Joshua. I think you can build this all throughout your Old Testament testament. 
uh, that God judges nations in history. I think there are some, maybe many, who think that God did what he did back then, but, you know, he doesn't really do that anymore, right? Um, certainly not now. I mean, uh, divine, divine judgment that upon nations, that was only in the Bible and in Bible times, and God doesn't judge nations today, right? Biblical precedence, I believe, is established across history that God judges nations in time. He judges nations in history. Every nation has a cup of divine wrath into which they are pouring iniquity and sin and transgression. And when that cup is full and overflowing, the picture that's painted in, in uh, highly figurative, prophetic, and poetic languages, God forces the nation to drink it to the dregs, and then the nation stumbles around in this drunken stupor, and they are primed and ready for God to wet His sword of divine judgment. And it's over for that nation. Now, again, don't try this without divine revelation, right? We may not be able to precisely determine direct divine judgment, but I do believe, again, the principle stands that God judges nations and every nation has a shelf life due to sin. Well, you know, okay, fine. But this would never happen in America. Don't be so sure. Uh, someone, I think, has rightly observed that if God does not judge America for the innocent blood that we have on our hands for all of the aborted children and babies, then he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. And I think that just might be right. Let's pray. And then we'll have final word. <clears throat> Lord God, this particular aspect of, of who you are causes us to tremble. Grow us and mature us to the point where we can glorify you for even attributes like this that cause us discomfort, that cause us to fear. Because we know that whether people cry out and give you honor and praise for what you have done and what you are doing, you will be glorified. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen.